Okay, good morning everybody. My name is Michael Emery. I'm the Director of Human Resources at the International Organization for Migration or UN Migration. I'm here today to talk about how to prepare for a competency-based interview. These are sometimes referred to as behavioral interviews or situational interviews. And uh, these are the types of interviews that most of the multilateral sector uses when they're assessing candidates. And, and by multilateral sector, I mean the uh, United Nations organizations, the EU organizations, the international financial banks, etc. Now, um, uh, with a competency-based interview, it's based on a, a pretty important premise, and that is that if you can demonstrate that you have done it or successfully done uh, the competency in the past, chances are you will be successful at doing it in the future. So if you've done it in the past, you will be able to do it in the future. So therefore, with competency-based interviews, many of the questions are focused on past experiences. And I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit as we go further into this, uh, into this recording. Now, uh, why do we use competency-based interviews? It's because uh, as a predictor of future performance, that is, how successful will you be when you start in a new organization, it's a very strong predictor. Um, uh, it's, it's estimated that a competency-based interview has a 0.51 uh, predictor of success, which when compared to all other metrics is, is, pretty, um, is pretty good. The only stronger predictor is a trial period, so an internship or a traineeship or something like that. Um, so this is why organizations use it, because they want to be able to choose the best candidates for a particular position. Now, uh, let's talk about when uh, you get the notification that you're about to have an interview. And the first thing I would say is prepare, prepare, prepare. Um, there's nothing more frustrating than coming into an interview as a panelist and having a candidate that is not prepared. So you need to be reading about the organization, you need to be reading about the mandate, you need to be Googling uh, all of the current issues, looking for the annual report, looking for statistics, etc. That's, that's very important. The, the second piece of advice I'd give you is when you actually apply for the position, make sure you save the vacancy notice. Um, because invariably, when you get notification of the interview, uh, you go back to look for the vacancy notice and it's gone off the web. And why is that important? Because the vacancy notice in multilateral organizations contain the core competencies that define success in the role that you're being interviewed for. Often you scroll down towards the end and it'll say important competencies. It'll be things like teamwork, strategic vision, planning and organizing, etc. And in preparation for the interview, it's very important that you have these competencies as a focus because typically the panel will ask only questions on those competencies. So that's why it's very, very important. Now, in terms of the structure of an interview, so you've been granted an interview, typically uh, an interview will follow the following structure. Firstly, there'll be some sort of a, an icebreaker question um, just to get you at ease and to get you talking. It might be something like, or oh, how's the weather in Vancouver today? Or how was your journey here to the office in Geneva? And then they'll go into more structured questions. And the first of the more structured questions is typically a motivation question. And invariably, in 90% of interviews, you get a motivation question. It'll be things like, why did you apply for this job? What is it about this position that you think you're a good candidate uh, for? Uh, what skills and attributes do you think would make you a successful candidate in this role? So you know you're gonna get a motivation question. And when responding to the motivation question, it's very important that you don't repeat what's on your CV. You can allude to it, but what the panel is really looking for is for you to explain what your value proposition is for the organization. They've read your CV, so they know what's in there. Um, what they want to hear is, what are you going to bring to this organization that is going to make it a better organization? So that's what your value proposition is. Um, after the motivation question, and, and again, you know you're going to get a motivation question, so prepare for it. Then they go into the body of the interview. And these are when they're asking questions on specific competencies. 
And at this point, uh, I want you to stick to a very important formula. I call it the CAR principle, C-A-R, and that stands for context, actions, and results. So if you're giving an example, give a brief context, then talk about the actions that are attributable to you, not to a team or not to a broader group, but what did you do in that example? And then very importantly, talk about the results or the impact of your actions. Now, a lot of candidates neglect to mention the third bit, the, the impact. But this is very important because when, an, when a panel is scoring you, they're actually taking notes and looking at context, your actions and the results or the impact of your interventions. Now there's a fourth letter that I often introduce as well, which is L, and that stands for learning. Often a panel will ask you about um, what did you learn from that experience? Or if you had your time again, how would you approach the situation differently? And this is a very important uh, aspect of the, of the response because the panel are looking at your ability to reflect and modify behavior accordingly. So um, think about that in terms of the, the structure of your answers, context, action, results, learning. Now, often people ask me, uh, how long should a response be? And that's a difficult uh, question to answer because it depends. Sometimes you go into a, an interview and they say, we have half an hour to do six questions. So do the math. Okay, we've got about five minutes per, per answer. Um, but generally speaking, I don't think you should be going for more than eight to 10 minutes per, per question in the, in the competency questions. And, and certainly you can be marked down if you're waffling or you're just um, um, saying a lot of nothing. And, and panel members are generally very good at seeing through people that are, that are waffling. Now, you've had, the, you've had the icebreaker, you've had the motivation, you've had the competency questions, and then at the conclusion of the interview, often you're asked if you have any questions of the panel. Now, for a lot of candidates, they struggle with this aspect of the interview because they don't want to ask necessarily an inappropriate or dumb question, but they want to see, they want to be able to promote that they've done their homework and they're prepared and they're motivated. Now, one piece of advice I have for candidates that struggle with this aspect of it is to have a, a pre-prepared statement. And uh, you might say to the panel, if it's okay with the panel, I don't have any questions, but I would like to provide some additional information if that's okay. And don't, don't go on for a long period of time, just, um, just sort of uh, reiterate your motivation for the position and uh, state anything that hasn't come out in the interview that you really wanted to come out in the interview. Um, you might also have some very genuine questions as well, and uh, there are some good sort of bog standard questions like, um, what would you expect of the successful candidate in the first 100 days of, of, um, of the position? Um, so, you know, things like that that uh, show that you've done your homework, that you've done your research on the position, and that you are motivated. Now, when the panel is assessing your answers, they're generally looking at uh, two different aspects of your response, the depth of the example and the complexity of the example. Now, I often uh, equate this to diving in the Olympics. Um, if you do a very simple dive, you can get great scores, but the complexity is not there. If you do a very complex dive, your score might be a little bit lower, but the complexity is there. I think it's very important that you choose your examples that are commensurate with the level of the position. So if you're going for a very senior position, you wouldn't use an example uh, that was something that was quite simple. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Um, one question I asked in an interview one time was, give me an example of when you were ethically challenged and how did you respond to that situation? And, and one candidate gave me an example of when she was in high school and her teacher accused her of cheating in a test. Uh, okay, well, that's pretty simple. Another candidate, in fact, the next candidate gave me an example of when um, he was working for an NGO and the government had arrested his parents and were torturing them and had asked him to sign a deposition against his boss who was the head of the NGO uh, otherwise, they would continue to incarcerate his parents. 
Now that's obviously a, a much more complex example with, uh, with much greater depth. Um, so this is what the, the panel is looking for. Also, subconsciously, and the panel don't even know this, but subconsciously they're looking for five different elements. One is conscientiousness. So how conscientious is the candidate appearing to come across? Um, so don't come across as flippant or, or nonchalant or not caring. The second one is emotional stability. Uh, and um, panels like candidates that are very emotionally stable. They don't like people that are all over the place emotionally. Um, they like candidates that are likable. They want to be able to say, yeah, I like this person. I, I can see myself working with this person. And they like people that are agreeable, that are agreeable to the culture of the organization and the culture of the workplace in which they're being assessed for. And uh, finally, they like people that are slightly extroverted and not overtly extroverted, but slightly extroverted. And this is a, can sometimes be a little bit of an issue if you're very, very shy as a person or very introverted and you may have to practice maybe coming out of your skin a little bit and being a little bit more animated. Now, um, in terms of the different types of interviews, um, basically now, particularly since the, the onset of the pandemic, there's three different uh, formats for interviews. There's telephone interviews, there's uh, video interviews through Skype or through Teams or through Zoom, and of course, there's still face-to-face -face interviews. Now, with telephone interviews, one of the things um, that I suggest to candidates is to stand up during the interview. You actually project your voice um, a lot better when you're standing up. Um, and you do have a couple of comparative advantages with a telephone interview. For example, you can have um, examples of your uh, competencies that you want to talk about um, on pieces of paper quite close to you, but also don't be seen to be reading from a prepared text. Um, but also you can use what I call pitch and tone and speed and silence to your advantage. Okay, because you want to be able to maintain the interest of the panel members because it's very difficult when you're not there face to face. So you really want to be able to maintain their interest. The second type, the, the video, the Zoom or Skype or Teams uh, type of interview, it's very important where your camera angle is. And uh, it's very important that you're seen to be looking into the camera. Often people take the interview with the camera on one side of them. So we're getting a profile rather than a front on. So make sure your camera is front on. Make sure your background is uh, tidy and appropriate and sensible. And um, uh, make sure what you're wearing is um, something that is commensurate with the position that you're being interviewed for. And typically in the United Nations, um, it would be erring on the side of conservative and perhaps um, something with a splash of color that brings out your personality in the interview. And then for the face-to-face the -face interviews, I think it's very important, firstly, well, with all interviews, you have to be punctual, but um, make sure that um, you come warmed up into the interview. Now, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that panelists will make up their mind about a candidate within the first 40 seconds. Um, and in fact, it might even be uh, much quicker than that. And that's what um, Malcolm Gladwell calls thin slicing the candidate. They walk into the room, they have an, an, an immediate impression of the candidate and they make a, an assessment accordingly. Now your role as the candidate is to make sure you get the panel past that first 40 seconds. So be warmed up, um, be animated, uh, and uh, really um, focus on, on the, the job at hand and make sure that you're ultra prepared for the interview. Um, I often talk about um, it's the importance of eye contact in a face-to-face -face interview and generally, if somebody asks you, one of the panel members asks you a question, when you're talking about the context, you might address that particular panel member, but then through eye contact and through hands, bring in the rest of the panel so that you are inclusive with your answer of all panel members. Now, I think it's also worth noting that um, 
uh, some candidates make some pretty preventable mistakes when it comes to interview. And I just want to touch on some of these common mistakes that people make. Uh, the first one is the choice of attire for an interview. I remember doing one interview where a young man came in chewing gum with a t-shirt with no collar with a Starbucks coffee and spent the whole interview chewing. Okay, it was very, very off-putting for the panel. So make sure you actually wear something that's appropriate. Um, the second mistake, particularly in the multilateral sector, is asking questions about benefits and entitlements. This information is readily available on the website, and uh, so there's, there's no, it's not really necessary to ask about that. It, private sector interviews, it might be a little bit different, and uh, that might be more appropriate, but certainly not in the multilateral sector. The third one, the third sort of major mistake that you can make is not being prepared. A panel can tell very quickly if you're not prepared for an interview. So prepare, prepare, prepare. Um, and when I say prepare, also be prepared where you're taking the interview. If you're in um, a place with very poor internet connectivity, you know, make the choice perhaps to go into a hotel room which has strong internet so that you can make sure that you have a successful interview. If you're taking it on a mobile phone, make sure your mobile phone is charged. There's nothing more frustrating than a, a phone dropping out during an interview. The next one is the use of inappropriate examples. Um, and I remember I was doing one interview once where we asked for a, a, an example of creativity and essentially what the person talked about was promoting modern day slavery through the use of, uh, of cheap labor. So really be very, very careful about inappropriate examples. That's why preparation is so important. You need to choose your examples in advance and choose them wisely. The next one is a little bit more difficult and that is uh, try not to be monotonal when, uh, when you're giving an interview, particularly on telephone interviews. You want to be able to maintain the attention of the panel. So be animated when you're talking in an interview. Try not to be monotonal. The next mistake is a poor question at the end of an interview. Uh, I remember one interview I was on and one of the candidates said, is your organization still relevant? And was trying to be provocative. And it went down very, very badly for it with a very senior panel. And um, uh, the last thing I'll say is uh, it's quite often these days that after an interview, a um, candidate will try to connect with panel members on social media. And that's considered a little bit of a, um, a no-no. And particularly, especially before the interview, if, if you know who the panel members are, please don't try to connect with them on, on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever. What is appropriate is to send some form of thank you. And if you really want to stand out, uh, the person that has organized the interviews for you, often it's an admin assistant or something, send them a nice little handwritten thank you note. And that's very, very appropriate to do that. And just say, look, I really enjoyed the experience. Um, I'm thrilled even to be considered for this position and I, I hope that um, it works out well. Now, when it comes to the types of questions, I just want to finish off with this. I think it's very important that we emphasize that the competency-based questions are based on previous experience. So for example, the types of questions you might get is, tell me about a time when you've been part of a dysfunctional team. What was your role in the team? And how did you address that dysfunctionality? What was the result? Typical question. Uh, we've mentioned one before, tell me about a time when you were ethically challenged. How did you respond to that challenge? Um, a values question, and often we ask this question, what are the three values that are most important to you? And how do these values translate into your work? And again, I wanna reiterate that it's very, very important that with your motivation response and with the, your, your end question, you must have your value proposition shine through. It's interesting that a lot of candidates, young and old, struggle with that question. It's not because they don't have a value proposition, it's because they haven't thought about the question. So perhaps that's your homework for tonight, is to think about what are the values that motivate me in work. You might get something uh, very simple, like a planning and organizing question. Tell me about a time when you've had to plan a major event. 
Um, what was the nature of the event? How did you engage stakeholders? How did you deal with setbacks? What was the end result? Typical competency-based question. Uh, and sometimes if the panel feel they're not quite getting um, you know, past the surface of who you are, they might ask you uh, a question to, to try to get you to know you a little bit better. And one question that one of my colleagues often asked was, uh, tell me about something that would surprise me about you. And these are the sorts of questions which are sometimes called co contrary evidence questions. If the panel feel that they're getting an overwhelmingly positive feel about you, they might ask you a contrary evidence question to check themselves. Or if they're feeling they're getting an overwhelmingly negative view of you as the candidate, they might throw you a lifeline to give you a, a, a simple uh, question to answer. Okay, so I hope you've um, found this little uh, simple tutorial useful. Um, I do hope that um, you remain interested in working in the multilateral sector, in particular in UN migration. And in fact, if you are interested in jobs in uh, IOM, I would really recommend that you go to our website, www.iom.int, and look at careers and jobs and vacancies. Um, we at any one time have 40 to 50 vacancies open. Um, and um, I would uh, want to wish you the best of luck when it comes to your next interview. Thank you.